In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, Amen. I'd like to welcome the Sorrow Ministry as well as our Perseverance family. And we'd like to start our conversation as always by inviting Mary to be with us. Mary has many wonderful titles. Mary is the Mother of God. Mary is the Mother of the Church. Mary is the mother of each and every one of us. When we pray that beautiful prayer, which is the Hail Holy Queen, at the end of the rosary, we also invoke Mary as our life, our sweetness, and our hope. Let's beg Mary to be with us, to pray for us, and to pray with us as we enter into our family conversation. Let's together pray the prayer that Mary loves most. And that prayer is the Hail Mary. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women Bless the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for our sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Now, my friends, let's invite our spiritual director to be with us. Our spiritual director is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit has one many wonderful titles also. The Holy Spirit is known as the Paraclete. Holy Spirit is also known as the Gift of Gifts. Holy Spirit is also known as the Sweet Guest of the Soul. Holy Spirit is also known as our Counselor. Holy Spirit is also known as our Consoler. Holy Spirit is also known as our Sanctifier. Many titles for the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is our interior master or teacher. St. Paul reminds us with these words, we don't know how to pray as we ought. But the Holy Spirit intercedes with ineffable groans so that we can say Abba. Abba, which means Daddy or Father. So together, let's pray. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful and enkindle within us the fire of your divine love. Send forth your spirit and they shall be created. And thou shalt renew the face of the earth. Let us pray. O God, who did instruct the hearts of your faithful by the light of the Holy Spirit, grant us that by the same spirit we may be truly wise and ever rejoice in his consolation through the same Christ our Lord. Amen. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be 
world without end. Amen. Our Lady Fatima, pray for us. St. Joseph, pray for us. St. Michael, pray for us. St. Gabriel, pray for us. St. Raphael, pray for us. St. Ignatius of Loyola, pray for us. St. Francis Xavier, pray for us. St. Maria Faustina Kowalska, pray for us. All God's angels and saints, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. So our friends in the Sower Ministry, as well as our friends in our Perseverance family, to encourage you, I'll be praying for you in the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass today. And of course, the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass is the greatest of all prayers. It's the greatest of all prayers. It is the prayer par excellence. So in my Mass, I'll, I'll place you on the altar, all of you. And pray first that all of us would be open to the inspirations of the Holy Spirit. Our sanctification depends upon our being docile and open to the inspirations of the Holy Spirit. May this be our prayer. Come, Holy Spirit, come. Come, Holy Spirit, come through the heart of Mary. Come, Holy Spirit, come. Come, Holy Spirit, come through the heart of Mary. My second intention I'd like to pray for all of your families, especially your loved ones teenagers, maybe they're young adults who have walked away from God. They've walked away from the church. They're seeking their happiness in a false God. I'd like to pray for them in my Mass that they would come back. That they would come back and find true happiness only in God. God is the true source of all happiness in this life as well as in the life to come. My third intention will be I'd like to pray with all of you for all those who are dying. That's right, for all those who are dying. St. Catherine of Siena, the great woman, doctor, mystic in the church, says that the two most important moments in our lives are now and at the hour of our death. How we die will determine our eternal destiny, either salvation or condemnation. So pray especially for those who are, who are far away from God, that they would turn to God and beg for infinite mercy. So I'd like to place those intentions on the altar. 
we would be open to the Holy Spirit, the conversion and sanctification of our family members. And let's pray also for those who will be dying today. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us be glad and rejoice in it. The Lord is truly risen. Alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. I'd like to briefly go through our church liturgical year, which takes us up to the wonderful feast day solemnity of divine mercy. So the Lenten season starts with, of course, Ash Wednesday which ashes were imposed in their forehead and the priest said, remember that you are dust and you shall return to dust. Pointing out our mortality that one day we're going to die. And as I said earlier, the grace of all graces is to die in the state of grace so that we can be saved and go to heaven for all eternity. When the ashes are imposed also, the priest can say, repent and believe in the gospel. That's taken from Mark chapter 1, verse 15. The word in Greek is metanoia, and it means a change of thought process and a change of lifestyle. Then on Ash Wednesday, the gospel for that day is taken from the Sermon on the Mount, which Jesus presents to us three different practices so that we can come to a real conversion of heart. And those practices are That of prayer, fasting, and almsgiving. Prayer, fasting, and almsgiving. We're called to go up through prayer. We're called to go in through penance. We're called to go out through almsgiving. Up, in, out. Then we enter into the season of Lent, the 40 days of Lent, as our Lord spent the 40 days in the desert, Moses the 40 years, with the Israelites wandering in the desert. Jonah preached in 40 days. Nineveh will be destroyed if they're not, they do not do penance. Then the culminating point of Holy Week, my friends, rather, Lent is Holy Week starting with, with Palm Sunday. Which will receive our palms, transporting us back to Jerusalem where Jesus was mounted on a donkey and they acclaimed him King. Hosanna, Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna, which we have in the Mass. Then on Palm Sunday, the priest comes out dressed in red garments, and you hear the Passion account read, the Passion, suffering, crucifixion, and death of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Then, Holy Week takes us to the very heart of Holy Week, which is called the Easter Triduum. 
Three to one, which means three. Means three. The three most important dates in Holy Week are Holy Thursday, Good Friday, and Holy Saturday. Holy Thursday, we go back to the upper room, and it's the Last Supper. In the Last Supper, in the Last Supper, Jesus celebrates the first Mass. And there Jesus institutes two sacraments, the Eucharist and Holy Orders. The Eucharist, Jesus takes bread and says, take and eat, this is my body, take and drink, this is my blood. Thereby instituting the great sacrament of the Eucharist. Then he says, do this in memory of me. Instituting holy orders or the priesthood. Now Good Friday, we go from the cynical or the upper room, we go to Calvary, where Jesus carries his cross. He's nailed to the cross. And there, as Fulton Sheen points out, from the pulpit of the cross, Jesus ascends and he gives his last and most eloquent sermon, known as the seven last words. And as Mary and John the Evangelist and Magdalene are underneath the cross, as the three consolers of Jesus. Jesus says from the cross, Father, forgive them for they know not what they're doing. And he says, I thirst. And he says, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Then he says to his mother, and his beloved disciple, woman, behold thy son, son, behold thy mother. Then he says to the good thief, amen, amen, I say to you, today you'll be with me in paradise. And he died a thief because he stole heaven. And then Jesus said, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. And Jesus says, it is finished, and he gives up his spirit and dies. Jesus is taken down from the cross, and he's placed in the tomb. And Holy Saturday is a day of silence and recollection. Silence and recollection in which we're called to accompany the Blessed Mother. We're called to accompany the Blessed Mother. We're called to, with the eyes and the heart of Mary, to Relive the passion of Christ through the eyes and the heart of Mary. That whole day. Then that very night, we celebrate the solemnity of all the solemnities, and that is we celebrate the resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ from the dead.
This is the day the Lord has made. Let us be glad and rejoice in it. The Lord is truly risen. Alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. That very night, my friends, we celebrate the most sublime, glorious Mass of the year. It's called the Vigil Mass, the Easter Vigil Mass. With the lighting of the fire, with the lighting of the Paschal candle, with the singing of the exalted, with the readings from the Old Testament, with the singing of the Gloria, with the baptism of the catechumens, the confirming of the catechumens, with the paschal candle lighted, with the church decorated with flowers, with all the people having their own little candle lighted, with the church breaking out singing Alleluia, Alleluia, Alleluia after four days, 40 days of Lent. So that's that's the solemnity of solemnities would be Easter. Easter is the rock foundation of our church year, liturgical church year. And the Sower Ministry, we've been going through basically the liturgical church year in our talks. So we've arrived at the very summit of the church year, which is the Easter day. And what the church teaches is that Jesus, Jesus truly rose from the dead. He truly rose from the dead. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us be glad and rejoice in it. He is truly risen from the dead. And this gives meaning to our lives because we all have our paschal mystery. We all have our sufferings, our crosses, our pains, our aches and pains our disappointments. But they have meaning in the light of the Paschal mystery, the passion, death, and resurrection for Christ. Jesus, risen from the dead, has great meaning because he opened up the gates of heaven for us. So that if we die with Christ to sin, we're raised to new life, we follow Christ, we obey his commandments, we love him in this life, we try to stay close to him in this life, we die in his grace and friendship, we will go to heaven. We will go to heaven. And that, my friends, my, that, my friends, is our ultimate destiny, is that we're all called one day to go to heaven. Pope John Paul II, when he visited Harlem, a very poor area in Bronx, the New York City, he said, but we are an Easter people. We are an Easter people. We have hope in the resurrection. Fulton Sheen, when he visited a leper colony and he met a woman who was eaten away by leprosy, her hands, her arms, her feet, her legs, she said, but there is a resurrection. There is a resurrection. There is a resurrection and I will have a glorified body. So my friends, that takes us into Easter Easter Sunday is celebrated, and then the whole week after Easter Sunday, 
the church celebrates Easter. It's the whole eight days is basically one day, the day of Easter. Jesus is truly risen from the dead, never to die again. Never to die again. Who did Jesus appear to? Even though this is not biblical, the Catholic Church in its tradition firmly believes that the first person that Jesus actually appeared to upon rising from the dead was his Blessed Mother. We as Catholics, we believe in the Bible, but we also believe in tradition. And common sense points out to us, of course he would have appeared to his Blessed Mother first. She was really the only one who didn't doubt. No one suffered more than Mary, but no one had more hope than Mary. She believed very firmly in her heart that Jesus died, but he would come back to life. So Jesus appears to his blessed mother. What are some of the other appearances of the risen Lord? Well, Jesus appears also to Mary Magdalene. And it's interesting that more than once when Jesus appears, they do not recognize him. Mary Magdalene thought that Jesus was the gardener. How often in our lives have we failed to recognize Jesus Christ in our lives? Let's pray that Jesus would take away the scales from our eyes so that we would be able to see him and understand him in the word of God that we meditate upon, in circumstances in life, in the beauty of nature, in people that we meet, but especially that we would encounter Jesus Christ in the holy sacrifice of the Mass, in the liturgy of the Word, and the liturgy of the Eucharist, which has been the thrust of our conversations with the Sower Ministry. We've been going through the liturgical church year in our conversations, that Jesus We really encounter Jesus Christ, especially in the Mass. The document Sacrosanctum Concilium, which is the dogmatic constitution on the liturgy from Vatican II, says that in Mass we encounter Jesus in the people that come together. Jesus said, where two or more are gathered in my my name, I am in their midst. We encounter Jesus in the reading of the word of God. We We encounter Jesus in the person of the priest, the altar Christus, in the words of St. Augustine, the other Christ. We encounter Jesus especially in the consecration in the Mass that bread that's consecrated, that wine that is consecrated, is no longer bread and wine. It is truly and substantially the body, the blood, the soul, and the divinity of Jesus Christ. We encounter Jesus in the joy of song. St. Augustine says, he who sings well, prays twice. But we especially encounter Jesus in the moment of Holy Communion, the intimate union with our soul, with Jesus himself. Then Jesus stays in the tabernacle so that we can come to visit him and so that 
Eucharistic ministers can bring communion to the sick people in their homes or the hospitals. The last words of Jesus Christ before ascending to heaven were, Behold, I am with you always, even until the end of time. And then he ascends on high. It seems almost to be ironic that he says, I'll be with you always until the end of time. Then he ascends and goes through the clouds. Where is he? Well, he would stay with us in his mystical body, which we call the church. And most specifically, through the sacraments. And the greatest of all sacraments, which is the Most Holy Eucharist. So, my friends, we should be drawn magnetically to Mass, to participate actively, fully, consciously in the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass. Knowing that living out Easter is related to living out the Mass and participating in the Mass. Because living out Easter is a call to our own resurrection and to our own salvation. Listen to this passage which is very much related to Easter. Taken from John chapter 6. Jesus said this, I am the bread of life. Whoever eats my body and drinks my blood will have everlasting life. And I will raise him up on the last day. That's the resurrection. I will raise him up on the last day. Moses gave your forefathers bread, but they died. Do not seek the bread that perishes, but seek the bread that gives eternal life. And that is the bread that I will give to you. And that bread is my flesh for the life of the world. So our essential focus, my friends, has been on the liturgical church year in Christ who is present in word and sacrament, but the sacrament of all sacraments is that of the Eucharist. So Easter, my friends, We celebrate that Saturday night, the Easter Vigil Mass. Then for another eight days, we're celebrating Easter. Jesus, who truly rose from the dead, he appeared to his Blessed Mother. He appeared to St. Mary Magdalene, even though she thought he was a gardener. He appears to two disciples on the road to Emmaus, and they don't recognize him either until they invite him, they sit down, he takes bread, he blesses the bread, he breaks the bread, he gives the bread to them, then their eyes are open. They recognize him in the breaking of the bread. Jesus appears to the apostles in the upper room. He goes through the wall, goes through the door, and says, Shalom, peace be with you. Receive the Holy Spirit. Whose sins you forgive, they shall be forgiven. Whose sins you shall bind, they shall be held bound. That was the institution of confession. There that Easter Sunday night, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ conferred on the church through the apostles the gift of forgiving sins. Then Jesus appears again. He tells them to go to Galilee. And they go to Galilee. And Peter says, I'm going fishing. They say, we'll go with you. So seven and go off fishing. 
They catch nothing the whole night. Then as the sun is rising, there's a man on the shore, and he cries out, My little children, have you caught anything? They say, No. Cast the net on the other side of the boat. Peter obeys, and they catch so many fish. John the Evangelist recognizes that it is Jesus, and he says, It is the Lord! Peter jumps into the water. He swims to the shore. It's about a hundred yards. And there Jesus is. He's preparing them breakfast. And after he prepares them breakfast, he takes a walk with St. Peter on the shore of the Lake Galilee. And to Peter, he asks this question, Do you love me? Yes, Lord. Well, Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord. Peter, do you really love me? Yes, Lord. So Peter, who had denied Jesus three times, he had to reaffirm his love. This is the triple reaffirmation of love of Peter. And Jesus was, was going to make Peter the, the, sheep, the chief shepherd of the flock, to be the first pope. And that, my friends, that takes us to we might call the culmination of the Easter day. The culmination of the Easter day is the second Sunday of Easter. The second Sunday of Easter. Now, a little bit of ecclesiology and the person of Pope St. John Paul II. As well as Maximilian Kolbe. As well as St. Maria Faustina Kowalska. Those are three Polish saints. They actually all lived at the same time. Colby was born in the late 1800s and died in 1941 in the concentration camp in Auschwitz. Faustina was born in 1905 and she died 1938 at 33 years. John Paul II, known also as Carol Wojtyla, was born in 1920, and he died the Vigil of Mercy Sunday, the year 2005. Those three Polish saints were actually living at the same time. And you might even call them the three the three rivers of mercy. Three of the great saint, modern saints binding them together was that of mercy. Of mercy. Now Let's go back to the year 2000. Year 2000, entering into the new millennium. John Paul II is weakening. He doesn't have the same vigor and vitality he had as, as a younger man. But John Paul II, now St. John Paul II, and I had the privilege of being ordained by John Paul II, so I have holy hair, thanks be to God, a holy head, because a saint touched me. I'm a third-class relic, praise the Lord.
John Paul II was inspired by the Holy Spirit. to carry out in the new millennium and it was April 30th, 2000 there are two extraordinary things that happened on the same day and that was the Sunday after Easter on that day John Paul II canonized the first saint of the new millennium. And that was Saint Maria Faustina Kowalska was canonized on April 30th, 2000, the first saint to be canonized in the new millennium. Very appropriate, very opportune. That same day, Pope, now St. John Paul II, would proclaim officially that the second Sunday after Easter would be solemnly proclaimed liturgically as the Solemnity of Divine Mercy. And commentators on the life of John Paul II have said that this was basically kind of his nunc dimittis, his the happiest day in his life. To canonize Saint Maria Faustina Kowalska known as the Secretary of Divine Mercy. who, thanks be to God, gave us what's called the Diary of Divine Mercy in My Soul. I recommend that all of you read and meditate the Diary of Divine Mercy in My Soul, St. Maria Faustina Kowalska. Strongly recommend that you all get a copy of Divine Mercy in My Soul and read it. You'll receive many blessings, a lot of peace, a lot of joy, a lot of lights, a lot of insight. It will definitely speak to you wherever you're at. So she was canonized on April 30th, the first to be canonized in the new millennium. Then Pope St. John Paul II would officially institute in the church liturgical year the second Sunday after Easter is Divine Mercy Sunday. Perhaps one of the happiest days in the life of St. Pope John Paul II. Really believe that it, it was his mission to preach mercy, to promote mercy, to write on mercy, and to live out mercy. In the history of the church, living out mercy was perhaps most clear in the life of John Paul II. We go back almost 20 years earlier, May 13th, 1981, John Paul II was shot there in front of the Basilica of St. Peter. 
he was rushed to the hospital. Many people prayed that he would not die. And he recovered. That was May 13th, 1981. May 13th is the first apparition of a Lady Fatima to the three little children, Jacinta, Francisco, and Lucia. That same year, after recovering, it was Christmas Eve, he went to visit in the prison the man that tried to kill him. The man who had the intention of assassinating John Paul II. Aga is his name. And you can see a YouTube in which he's in the prison cell, drawing close and giving this man an embrace. So not only did John Paul II preach on mercy, not only did John Paul II write on mercy, but also John Paul II lived mercy in his own flesh. Living up what Jesus said on the cross. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they're doing. So, my friends, as we reflect upon divine mercy, related the life of John Paul II. Probably most of you know that John Paul II died April 2nd, 2005, which was the first Saturday of the month dedicated to the Immaculate Mary. He died about 9 p.m., and that was actually the vigil of Divine Mercy Sunday. Five years after he had instituted it, he died on the vigil of Divine Mercy Sunday. And his last, the last thing that he actually ate was he received the Eucharist. So as we reflect upon the feast day of Divine Mercy, And the many promises that flow from divine mercy. Let us all examine our own lives. With respect to mercy. And there are various dimensions. First of all, perhaps some of us have not fully forgiven someone that has hurt us. Perhaps we're still holding on to resentment. Perhaps we're holding on to past hurts. Perhaps there's still some inner bitterness within our souls. Now's the time to forgive. Jesus, quoting Isaiah, says, I've come to set the captives free. Those who are holding on to resentment are basically their slaves of their own resentment. By forgiving, we're setting the captive free, and that captive is me and you. And remember, 
Jesus says, be merciful as your heavenly Father is merciful. Also, the Lord's Prayer. When we pray the Lord's Prayer, we say, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. One of my priest friends, preaching on the Our Father, very bluntly said this, if you don't want to forgive that person that has offended you, then don't pray the Our Father which is forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. He's basically saying you're just paying lip service. You're being hypocritical. If you want to live out the Our Father, we're called to forgive. To forgive those who have hurt us. And forgiveness, my friends, it's not an emotion. It's not a feeling. It's a decision of the will. So the first dimension of mercy is that we should forgive those who have hurt us. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Second, and this is hard because of our pride, we should ask forgiveness towards those that we have hurt. When I do weddings, I'll tell the couples, there are three things that you have to say very often in your married life. You have to say, honey, I love you. But then we also have to say, I'm sorry. And we also have to say, forgive me. I love you. I'm sorry. I forgive you. Love and humility related to mercy are the two foundations of the married life. And then there's a third dimension of mercy. And it's this. Whenever we sin, we are hurting God. There are many definitions of sin. I like the best one, I think, is Fulton Sheen. He says, sin is hurting the one you love. Sin is breaking a commandment, but also it's breaking the heart of God. We're all sinners. We're all sinners. But the greatest attribute in God himself, in Jesus Christ, as taught by John Paul II and Faustina and St. Thomas Aquinas and other saints, the greatest virtue, the greatest attribute of God is his infinite mercy. Infinite, which means no limits. And that is this. On Mercy Sunday, the gospel is, the apostles are in the upper room. Jesus goes through the doors. In his glorified body, he says, Shalom. And he says, Receive the Holy Spirit. Whose sins you forgive, they shall be forgiven. Whose sins you retain, they shall be retained. So that gospel for Mercy Sunday, taken from John chapter 21, Jesus was conferring upon the apostles, the first bishops and priests, the ability to forgive sins in his name. 
So living out, living out divine mercy, which is divine mercy Sunday, but we should try to be living out mercy all the days of our lives. We should all be living out divine mercy by having frequent recourse, recourse to a sacrament. And that sacrament is the sacrament of confession, also known the sacrament of God's mercy, also known as the sacrament of God's forgiveness. How beautiful these words. How beautiful these words. My son, I absolve you from your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Your sins are forgiven Go in peace. Give thanks to the Lord for his good, for his mercy endures forever. So my friends, in the Sower Ministry and Perseverance family, we've had a very good conversation today going through the liturgical church year culminating in our conversation on Divine Mercy Sunday. I pray and hope that all of you, my friends, will become missionaries of Divine Mercy. And I'd like to impart to all of you my priestly blessing. The Lord be with you. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Share this message with, me, with many of your friends. Give thanks to the Lord for his good, for his mercy endures forever. Amen.